thank you. <laughs> Dr. Len, doctor, oh, why not? You are a doctor. Yes. Uh, Eleni Huzak, uh, like so many of her peers in America, Eleni Kostopoulos, as she was known before she was married, entered kindergarten in Portland, Oregon in the 1930s, speaking very little English. 1940s, speaking very little English. Sorry. Um, with the constant encouragement from her immigrant parents, Eleni excelled in school. Her intellectual ability and immigrant work ethic resulted in her being accepted at the University of Chicago at the age of 16. Success in academics was mirrored in her professional life. A graduate of the John Marshall School of Law, Ms. Huzag has had a distinguished and diverse legal career for more than 40 years. In the spirit of true orthodox philotimia, Ms. Huzag directed her energies to the betterment of the institution she has loved the most, her church. In 1974, with, her, with limited leadership opportunities for women in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, Eleni was one of among five women who were the first women ever to be appointed to the Archdiocesan Council, serving as Vice President of the Council from 1988 to 1990. One of Mrs. Huzak's most visible roles has been in presiding over plenary sessions of several clergy laity congresses. In 1996, she was awarded the Medal of St. Paul, the highest honor that the Archdiocese bestows upon a layperson. Most recently, she served as a member of the Archdiocesan Charter Review Committee. In 1979, Eleni began her long affiliation with the National Council of Churches at that time being appointed as the only member of the Greek Orthodox, of the only woman member, excuse me, of the Greek Orthodox delegation to the Council. For more than 20 years, she served in various capacities with the National Council, from recording secretary to participating in several international delegations. Her many years of involvement with the Council culminated with her appointment in 2002 as the 21st President of the National Council of Churches. She is the first Orthodox woman, lay, Orthodox layperson and woman, to become NCC president and one of only five laypersons to serve as president in the council's history. We were very fortunate this past May as an institution, Helena College and Holy Cross, to bestow on Ms. Huzak the honorary doctorate of humanities for her leadership in the nation's largest movement for Christian unity, as well as for her leadership in the Orthodox Church here in America. Uh, the committee uh, that put together tonight's event and the weekend's event thought long and hard about who we would want to ask to open up our session, and Eleni was uh, at the top of our list for several reasons, as I've already noted, but most in particularly because she's a person who has, I think, not only the heartbeat of the Archdiocese, but also the heartbeat of America. And Eleni, we welcome you here this evening. Thank you for being here. how wonderful my commencement speech was, speech was, or I would have brought it and given it again this evening. Uh, I actually wrote one. Um, before I get there, I'd like to uh, thank Father Frank, thank everybody who helped put this together, thank all of you for being here, and more importantly, all of you here and others who will go out there. Now, a couple of other points. It really is an honor for me to be here at my alma mater. Don't you love it? <laughs> I really appreciate this unexpected honor. And I will autograph uh, copies of the Orthodox Observer when my picture was on the front page. Uh, but you have to bring your own copy um, while I'm here. After I'm gone, it's a, it's a one-time offer. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask, you know, when I checked my bag, my registration bag, I didn't find my little bar of soap that you get from the motel to be able to take your bath while you're in, in, the, same, in the chapel. Did anybody else find their soap missing as well, or was it just me? Okay. My remarks tonight are going to be in two parts, because a father thought I should recite a few of my experiences, so that's the good part. So please stay away to the first part. Uh, the first part I'm calling the offeror and the offeree. Uh, according to the program, the theme of this institute reflects the focus of the 2002 Clergy Lady Congress, offering orthodoxy to contemporary America. And of course includes lectures, workshops, examined theological, liturgical, scriptural, pastoral, 
musical, administrative, all kinds of issues. But this is the underlying problem theme. Now, if this were a legal transaction, and you notice where I'm going here, we would describe the church as the offeror, and those to whom we're making the offer as the offeree. And I will use these terms during the course of this part of my remarks for the purpose of clarity. Now, because it's a gift, which is the subject of the offer, it is also understood that the offeree need not accept it. Now, before we consider that aspect of this transaction, let's explore the nature of the gift. Simply put, the Orthodox Church offers an understanding of God's reality, which enables us to become God-like. In other words, to exist in a continuous state of being saved. Because salvation is not an instant, add water, one-time occurrence, but rather a lifetime of constant synergistic endeavor in the wholeness of creation. This, of course, is the greatest gift of all. Now we might wonder who are the likely recipients of this gift. Because we're dealing with contemporary America, we must examine the nature of our country in its many diversities in order to understand how we need to make our offer known and understood. We can't just deal with our own church community or the Greek American aspect of our lives. We need to see all of contemporary America as a potential offeree for our offer. However, it seems logical to start with the offerors, persons we do know within our own archdiocese who have the gift of understanding our faith and also to be able to gift it to others. This seminary and this institute are some of our tools for the preparation of our people who will be offering our faith. In fact, for your preparation. All of us here are offerors. While we do not proselytize, we do receive those who come to us. And increasingly, more and more are coming to receive our gift with little or no effort on our part. Good examples of this is our multitude of church festivals each year, which frequently result in festival converts. I first heard that a few years ago at the diocesan assembly. I thought, what are those? Ah, now we know. Uh, does anybody not know what that means? You're in much better shape than that. Uh, and of course, our ever increasing marriages between Orthodox and other Christian traditions, and even with those of other faith backgrounds. In all of these instances, there was little or no proactive effort on our part to offer our faith to contemporary America. But rather, many, many instances of individuals seeking and finding on their own. In considering the offerees, there are in our archdiocese many baptized but unchurched people who are part of the body of our church, whether they understand this connection or not. They have received the gift, but have chosen not to open it. We must reach them and inspire them to unwrap it. Those who are not Orthodox in America, who are seeking and finding parts of the truth in other places, and moving from one religious experience to another are many. And finally, they give up in desperation, unaware of the gift that we offer. I mentioned earlier that the gift need not be accepted by the offeree. Certainly, we have many of our own who have made that regrettable choice. But I also believe that such a choice is made unknowingly. That is, they do not know what is contained within the wrapping. And for those who may be unaware, the opportunity to know of our gift must first be offered by us, that opportunity. It is essential that in making the offer, the nature of the gift be known. It is not sufficient to say, we are the church. 
our services are both ancient and relevant and exceedingly beautiful, and so forth. And it is not much of an offer if we say to the offeree, you are not like us. So as to make being like us a condition of receiving the gift, acting as the Pharisee in relation to the publican. We must make our offer a matter of hospitality, as did Abraham and Sarah. After all, each Xenos, guest, is not only an icon of God, but who knows when and in what form God may choose to come among us. The 2002 Clergy Lady Congress theme was a striking departure from past thematic selections, which were always taken, quotations taken from the Bible. While surprising, this selection signaled a new vision of who we are in this time and in this place. This is, however, not a new idea. And from the Great Commission until the first proposal for an ecumenical movement, this offer has been and should be an essential part of our lives as Orthodox Christians. <clears throat> Therefore, while offering Orthodoxy to contemporary America, may be a sound and desirable task. America is no longer a Judeo-Christian nation, primarily comprised of Trinitarian Christians. Many Americans are Muslims, Buddhists, or no faith tradition at all. It is difficult to offer when the people to whom the offer is being made are so diverse and the tax task is so complex. But at the same time, this is an unusual time in history in that all of the diverse Christian traditions are present in the same place and are speaking a common secular language. Our presence in this environment is both a concern and an opportunity. A concern because we do not wish to become the other and an opportunity because we offer much to the other. Not to mention the fact that there is much we can learn as well. We, each of us, have an obligation to heed the directive of our Lord, to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the close of the ages. This cannot be accomplished if we do not share our faith, our vision, our gift with others. We cannot send our people to offer without a clear understanding of what is being offered and how to offer in ways that are contextually appropriate. We would prefer not to, we would prefer not to learn by doing, which system also includes trial and error. This tri-level institute seeks to accomplish the foundational structure for those who are committed to the offering of our faith to diverse peoples in diverse ways in contemporary America. At this point, I think I've basically tried to put before you what we're all about and who we are talking to and what environment we are dealing in. Father Frank asked me to then comment on some of my experiences because I can assure you, I did not start out my career studying theology and even imagining that I would be offering our faith to anybody other than my son and trying to convince my husband to convert. That was sort of my frame of reference at that point in my life. And it's fascinating what happens to you when you are put in a diverse environment, which is an environment based on the Christian faith, because that's what the National Council of Churches is. These are all Christian churches coming to, together to see what we can accomplish together. And as one learns about each other, you see, I had to go look and see what my faith was about and understand my theology, understand my church, understand my traditions in order to be able to share them with others. And this is something all of us can do. We don't have to be graduates of the seminary there are plenty of people we can ask. There are many, many sources, many, many more resources now than there were when I first started in this. And as, I, as you heard, Archbishop Yacobus 
first sent me to the National Council of Churches in 1979. Uh, I thought at the time that he was sending me there in the hope of keeping me from aggravating him on the Archdiocesan Council. Uh, the, the mistake he made was leaving me on the council because then I could still aggravate him. At the same time, it was rather interesting in those days, uh, Metropolitan Maximus, who was then Bishop Maximus, was appointed the head of our delegation. And Bishop Demetrius, whose maiden name was Jim Cushell, was also there as a proxy for the Archbishop. We didn't really know the other Orthodox. And we looked at the list you know, of the daily events, and each of the denominations was having a denominational dinner. And so I asked one of my Methodist friends, what do you all do there? So well, we discuss the agenda, and we discuss what we're going to do, and questions people have, and so on. That sounds like a pretty good idea. So Bishop Maximus and I sat down and said, when are the Orthodox meeting? Well, we didn't know, because we didn't know anything. Why don't we set up a meeting? So I actually, this is true, wrote little hand notes, handwritten notes, and went around the, the big meeting room, because we had signed, you know, what church you are, Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, you know, Armenian Archdiocese, uh, the OCA, Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Episcopal, all that. And anybody who looked like Orthodox, I put a little note in front of them. Eat us for lunch. So about seven people showed up. We all looked at each other and said, ah, oh, hi, how are you? And um, we, ought, we ought to get together. The next time we had the assembly, because there were two a year in those years, we had an actual dinner of actual Orthodox people who were there. This was incredible. Who are you? I don't know. Uh, and, really, this was very strange. Um, particularly for those of us who aren't in the ecumenical hotbed of New York, where everybody knows everybody. And even in those days, not everybody did, truthfully. What made it interesting was it was an Eastern and Oriental Orthodox caucus. This is now 1979, 1980. As we speak now, besides what's gone on in the international levels between the Oriental and the uh, Eastern churches, uh, Scoba and Scooch are speaking to each other. And where do you think things like this start? They start in a neutral, non-threatening environment by people who are committed to us speaking to each other. And one of the first places we ought to be speaking to each other at is when we speak to our other Orthodox friends. Meanwhile, one of the most interesting experiences I had, which was very strange and at the same time caused great pain and great stress, was in the early 1980s when the Universal Fellowship of Metropolitan Community Churches applied for membership in the National Council of Churches. Mm -hmm. For those of you who are not familiar, it is a church that is, was founded on the basis of the gay and lesbian exclusion from other churches, and so they formed their own denomination and applied for membership. This caused enormous controversy and enormous difficulty. At one point, they established a theological commission to discuss the theology behind the formation of this church so it would be clear for everybody. And I get a notice that I am now on this theological commission. <laughs> yeah, that didn't make much sense to me, but it turned out it was because they didn't have enough women. Oh. I passed that one. So, uh, and as a lawyer person, I have no clue what I can offer to this, but I made a grid. This was a wonderful grid, and listed all of the churches and what their position was and what the source was. What so was the Bible, uh, their congresses, their assemblies, their canons, whatever. And it was really cool. So we get to the meeting, it was in New York, and Father Tom Hopko was one of the co-chairs of that group that was meeting. This was like a two and a half day session. And we went around the room introducing ourselves. I'm name so-and-so, my church is, blah, 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 blah. And we get down to the Armenian priest, whose name escapes me, thank goodness, who got up and said, my name is Father So-and-so, I think homosexuality is a sin, and I'm not going to stay here. He walks out of the room. Now, remember, why did he come? You know, people are seriously trying to understand what's going on. And then we get to someone from another church, and I said, you know, I didn't know what, on what basis, you know, what is the theological reasoning behind, you know, your position? And the fellow looked up and he said, well, we have no theology. <laughs> now imagine, you think this is funny, this is serious. They, they vote on these things. And for them, it works. I can't sit there and say, well, you're, and walk out, as did the Armenian priest. Because at some point, you're talking to fellow human beings, to people who sincerely believe what they're talking about. 
And this isn't you're going to buy their belief necessarily, but perhaps you can help clarify. Trust me, these are very stunning moments. Um, some of the things we've done that's also been very interesting is at one time, for those of you that are old enough, if you may remember that Pope Shenouda of the Coptic Church was under house arrest by Sadat for a number of years. The ostensible reasoning behind that was that the uh, fundamentalist Muslims were going to do damage to him if they allowed him to be out in public. Uh, the National Council of Churches, the Coptic Church is a member of the National Council of Churches, mm -hmm. was educated on the Coptic Orthodox Church. We passed resolutions, we contacted the President of the United States, we did everything in our power we could do as a council, and as Orthodox part of the council, because our caucus, both Eastern and Oriental, took it on as a very serious cause. And at, by golly, he was released from house arrest. And part of the reason for that, part of why it was done, was because of what we did. Something else you don't know. At that time, early 80s, Bob Grimley, Bishop Bob Grimley, was the head of the Lutheran Church in America. In conjunction with the Coptic situation, we were also telling him and others about the situation at the Ecumenical Patriarchate. He became so interested by what was happening he made sure that he took a delegation of his bishops from the Lutheran Church to visit the patriarch, who was Demetrius at that time. Came back and said, that is the worst situation. We can't allow that to take place. We are going to make this one of our priorities in the Lutheran Church in America. And the Lutheran Church moved its headquarters to Chicago, as you may know. And it's interesting to know that for several years, they meet every two, three, whatever it is, the Metropolitan from the Patriarchate, who was the liaison to the, Episcopal, to the Lutheran Church, was Patriarch Bartholomew. And so he would come to Chicago to go meet with the Lutherans, and the only way we knew was because we got to meet him for dinner along the way. So there are things going on in places you can't imagine that can not only help us, but in the course of helping us, we're able to share things. Because we don't have to rush up and tackle somebody on the street corner with a Xipni magazine or something. We can actually talk to people. You got it, didn't you? <laughs> you can actually talk about religion seriously with people who have a serious concern about it. This to me is amazing, and I just thought this was wonderful. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the first delegations was when I was recording secretary of the NCC. We went to the Middle East. It was right after Beirut fell. And we started out in Egypt, where we went and met with Pope Shenouda, who is now free, and wanted to thank us. And I must tell you, the Coptic compound in Cairo is phenomenal. I don't know if any of you have been there, but it is well worth a visit. There's also a Coptic museum in that city, which you can also visit. And so we went to the publishing house with the museum, and they were just finishing the Cathedral of St. Mark. Beautiful, beautiful, enormous thing. And what they did was absolutely wonderful. When the cement outside was still wet, they had a school there, a uh, religious school with maybe a thousand students, little kids, little bitty kids, little bigger kids, gave them each a little wooden stick. And every kid got to go up and make the sign of the cross in the wet cement up until as high as they could reach. So it was sort of all these crosses going around this enormous building, starting about this far off the ground until maybe, you know, as high as the oldest kid could reach, all the way around the building. And you had to stand there and say to yourself, isn't this just the most remarkable thing? Here are these people, and goodness knows where from our life, having an amazing and wonderful religious experience of sharing and believing and teaching the faith. We also, for the first time, encountered the churches of the Middle East. And we kept meeting people who kept describing themselves as Greek Orthodox. Now for those of us who were the uninitiated, that was me, uh, I couldn't imagine whose jurisdiction they were under. I'd say, well, are you under the Patriarchate of Jerusalem? Well, no. Then who's your patriarch? Well, it's Antioch. In that part of the world, Greek is not used as ethnic. It is used to describe the Eastern Orthodox Church. It's entire. So everybody's Greek. 
the Russians, the Japanese. So I'm serious. Uh, and you learn very interesting things. We met leader, leaders of Israel, uh, leaders of Syria. Uh, I was proposed to, oh, that was a good one. I went out to see the pyramids in the morning. I'm not joking. This, and everybody in the group had seen them. They said, well, you better go because we're leaving today. So I take a 5 a.m. taxi. Guy takes me out. There's nobody there. And he asked me if I was married. I said, yes. He said, well, I can have more than one wife. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm the only person in this taxi. Nobody went with me. And so he kept proposing to me and insisted he, I was the love of his life and all that. So we get back to the hotel. I said, look, I said, I have to talk to my husband about this. Because <laughs> one year ago from, from now, I'll be back in this very spot. And I'll give you my answer. That seems satisfying. I haven't been back yet. <laughs> Another interesting experience was in Damascus, in Syria. Anybody who's been there, the most uh, amazing structure is the Umayyad Mosque, which used to be a Christian church. And as I understand the history of that, uh, as the Muslim community grew and grew, they said, well, gee, can we sort of have services there and pray there maybe once a week? And then pretty soon it was twice a week. And eventually it was give us the mosque or give us the church, which they did. Uh, but what's interesting about it is that location happens to house the head of St. John the Baptist. And we went into the mosque, which is really quite beautiful, and they had sort of a, uh, like a wrought iron gilded fence, very tall, inside of which is a catafalque with a casket on it. Uh, it's a beautiful thing, and people are venerating it. You could see pieces of paper with prayers written on them, money, tokens, uh, uh, religious tokens of some type. Uh, so if you ever go to Damascus, do go and see the mosque, and you too can venerate one of our saints at the same time. Um, let's see. On that particular trip, it was quite interesting because we concluded the trip in Cyprus because the Middle East Council of Churches used to be in Beirut, but when it fell, it had to go somewhere else. So it relocated in Cyprus and is still there to this very day. But what was unique about the trip was because it provided us with one of the most emotional moments of the entire trip. We met with the Committee of the Missing, who had not been seen or heard from since 1974 and the invasion of the Turkish military. Uh, this really just stopped everybody cold. Uh, it was an, an incredible experience. And if you've ever, and you don't want to be, in a position where you're sitting in a room watching people tell you how their loved ones are completely disappeared and nobody knows. Uh, it's very, very painful. Everybody in our group, we're about 10 of us, were in tears. Uh, another thing I should tell you is when you go to that part of the world, don't drink the water. Uh, and I didn't realize in Syria that the water includes the ice cubes. So I missed Jordan entirely. <laughs> it was only one day in Jordan, but I missed it all. Now another interesting experience, and, and this has to do with offering your faith, you see. Uh, the United Methodist Church has a women's board of global ministry. The women's board of the United Methodist Church in the early 80s had an annual budget of $16 million, just the women's board. And so they had projects each year. And that particular year, their project was orthodoxy. So their executive board went off to the Middle East to see the Orthodox churches up close and personal and took movies. Then they invited Orthodox women from here, at their expense, mind you, to come to New York and meet with them and talk about our faith, which we did. And so we had a number of the graduates of our seminary, also St. Vladimir's, and there we were. So we get in the room, they say, and welcome, and all this stuff, and this is our project, and we want to show you a movie about the hierarchs we met in the Middle East. And we thought, this is really wonderful, this is so cool. And they put up the movie, every single hierarch was from an Oriental church. An Arab, a Copt, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, Armenian, a Copt, Syrian, not a single one was from the Eastern Orthodox world. And so they stopped the movie, they're, you know, they're all happy because they've now shown us our hierarchs, and we all sat there and we said, well, those were the wrong hierarchs. <laughs> Which, of course, gave us several hours of discussion on the history of our church. 
which the bottom line in that instance turned out to be that everybody who spoke Greek stayed and those who didn't left. I think that sums up the Council of Chalcedon as we understand it. Okay. I um, also had another interesting experience, which wasn't quite as pleasant, but was something that you will probably not do in the course of your lives. Uh, one of the things that came up is, one of the things the National Council of Churches has always been concerned of is fairness and justice for those who are the least among us. And I think uh, John knows a great deal more about that than I do. But as it turned out, there was a time when discussion was going on about whether or not to call our members to strike against Campbell's soup. Because Campbell's soup bought tomatoes and cucumbers from farmers in Ohio who were paying less than minimum wage and keeping very, very grim facilities for the migrant workers who would come up and pick the crops. So I end up somehow appointed to this committee, the Campbell Soup Flock Boycott Committee. And we went to the farmer's fields. We met with the Campbell Soup executives. We literally walked in the mud. We went into people's homes, if you can call them that, and saw for ourselves the conditions that people are living under in order to pick the tomatoes that make your tomato paste, your tomato sauce, and your tomato soup. And at the close of the day, these people who have less than nothing provided dinner for all of us. This really changes your view in many ways of what reality is all about. And most of us have not ever, or are likely to ever have that kind of an experience. Um, then I took a sabbatical for a few years away from the NCC. Uh, see, the title of this part of my speech is Been There, Done What? <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, I had felt I'd been there and done, done that. And finally, Bishop Demetrius, who became the ecumenical officer, convinced me in uh, 1996 to return to the delegation. Just for four years. Just for four years. Don't worry about a thing. I said, no, I don't want to do that. He said, for me. <laughs> okay, uh, four years, that's it. Well, at the end of the four years, then I was offered the opportunity now to become president-elect. And if once you're elected in that position, two years later, you become president automatically. So I'm thinking, I'm talking to my family, I'm thinking of, when I was living in Chicago and it was 20 minutes from O'Hare Airport, this did not happen to me. I now live on the Oregon coast, two hours from the nearest airport. Now it's going to happen to me. However, for my church, I will make the sacrifice. Um, it was a unique opportunity, obviously. It has been an incredible experience. And since, oh, the best part was the installation. I was installed on November 15, 2001 at Ascension Cathedral in Oakland. Normally, you go to the home parish of the president who was being installed, or their hometown. Uh, my church is Holy Trinity in Portland, Oregon, which some of you are familiar with. The Solea in that church will accommodate three people. Because <laughs> whoever the architect was in the 50s when that thing was built, it's a lovely church. I cannot be beautiful. And about 300 people standing up. And here we have now 350 people on the NCC board, plus all of the West Coast people and others who are friends of mine, there's two or three of them at least, uh, who will come out for this event. So there we are now, and we have a full Orthodox Vesper service, <coughs> 12 or 13 clergy assisting the Archbishop, who is presiding at the service, uh, his deacon, a couple of other deacons, just in case, uh, and several other folk, I'm not sure what their, what their uh, mission was. My son, who got to read uh, a couple of the prayers during the Vesper service, which made me very proud of him, and here it is, the church can hold 40 people on the Soleil easy, so it was not a problem. The installation service itself took 10 minutes, and then we went out for dinner and festivities. But the important thing was this. One of the customs of the National Council of Churches, when they install the officers, which is every four years, or every four years, or install the president as it came in my turn, is that there's a procession down the aisle with each of the communions who are members, we have 36 communions that belong to the NCC, carrying a candle. And they had in Cleveland, I remember, a candle stand. And it was impossible to get the candles in. So a big discussion now how to do this so it's graceful and then it's not a mess. 
So what we came up with was this. Every chameleon came down holding one of the votive candles, you know, the tall red candle. Each one came down, handed it to a priest who was standing in the solea, who took it into the altar and placed it on the altar. By the time we finished, the candles of all 36 communions of the council were sitting on the same altar. I can't tell you how many people were moved by just that fact alone. We also had an arteplasia, so that when everyone left, everyone had something when they left the church. And I stood outside, because I didn't want to jam up the church kissing people. I must have kissed 350 people at that point. People still talk about it. They, I don't know if I gave them a disease or what, but it was an extraordinary experience. The entire service was in English. Uh, choir, Taiki Zess was there, very Taiki. It was, would you agree? Wonderful. You did a beautiful job. Thank you. He directed the choir. It was unforgettable. There's movies and films where I could sell them. Okay, now I'm president. What do I get to do now? And it all starts out here in Boston because I was invited by the Massachusetts Council of Churches to bring greetings as president of the NCC on the occasion of the admission of the Diocese of Boston as a member to the Massachusetts Council. They were celebrating their 100th anniversary as a Council of Churches, which had been only Protestant until then. And so that was an experience, if you can imagine, to be in that setting and also not only be president of the NCC, but an Orthodox president. Then I get to go to Cuba, because Metropolitan Pinagoras got permission from the Cuban government to build a new Orthodox church in Old Havana, which is the most sacred historical location in all of Havana. And I went down to the groundbreaking and brought greetings from the National Council of Churches as the Orthodox president of the NCC to this very unique and unusual event as well. Uh, then, and this was again not one of the happiest events, but I was one of the leaders of the delegation to the Middle East in the spring of 2002. This was at the very time that the Church of the Nativity was under siege. And we started our visitation at the Patriarchate. Then we went to Lebanon, met with the president of uh, Lebanon who had a state dinner. Uh, Syria, we met with the president of Syria, Bashir Assad. He was very tall, by the way. This man is easy, 6'11", and is a, as an ophthalmologist by training. He studied in England. Then we went to Jordan. We met with the king. Then we went to Israel and Palestine. Now, because of the bombings and the things that have been going on and are still to a great degree going on, Israel, Jerusalem was virtually empty. There was nobody there. We met with the Patriarch of Jerusalem, and as many of you may know, he was elected almost two years ago, and his election has yet to be ratified by the Israeli government. If you don't know why that's necessary, there's a historical uh, requirement out of the Ottoman Times or wherever, it is, I believe it's the Ottoman Times, that the territorial governance of uh, the territory, the civil governments whose territory the patriarchate uh, has jurisdiction over must, number one, approve the nominees for patriarch, and number two, must ratify the election once it's been held. And after Patriarch Theodorus died, they went to have the election, published the list of the nominees, and for the first time in history, one of the territorial governance, governments struck three names off that list. The Palestinian Authority said fine, Jordan said fine, Israel struck three names. So the Synod of the Patriarchate says, okay, we won't have an election. Time goes on, time goes on. So they finally rescinded their action and allowed the election to take place. Of course, one of the three names they struck was the man who was elected patriarch, ultimately, Irenaeus. Now, Phase two, Jordan approved, ratifies the election, Palestinian Authority ratifies the election, Israel refuses to ratify. Now as it happened, the day we were there at the Patriarchate happened to be the very day after uh, the uh, Prime Minister Sharon 
had been set to sign his name to the ratification, and one of the members of his parliament or his party said, oh, you shouldn't sign. You know, I've heard he's very friendly with the Palestinians, who happen, of course, to be his constituency, but hey. And something you may or may not know, the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Jerusalem is the largest landowner in the state of Israel. They own the property upon which the Knesset sits. They own the property upon which the university sits, and many, many others. So uh, to this day, ratification has not occurred. Now, one of the people in our group who doesn't understand how these things work asked this very interesting question to the patriarch. He said, and is this a problem for you, Your Holiness? Now, what is the man going to say? He said, oh, no, I perform my liturgical functions and fine. But the problem is that he's not a legal entity. Can't do any legal, can't take any legal actions under the civil law in the state of Israel. Can't sign leases, can't go out, can't come back, and so forth. So we're still working on that. I mean, the NCC has passed resolutions. We've sent letters to our government. We've sent uh, the American Jewish Committee is working with us. I mean, there isn't hardly anybody from here that hasn't tried to have, help make this happen. So that's another issue. At the same time, we have the Church of the Nativity with the people inside. Now, that's a very interesting thing because we met with the Latin patriarch, who is an Arab Christian. We met with the Armenian patriarch, who used to be on the NCC governing board here in America. And of course, we met with the patriarch of Jerusalem. Those are the three patriarchates, those are the three churches who have part of the Church of the Nativity. The largest area is the property of the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate. Then we have the Franciscan Chapel, which is how the, the Fallings got in, and we have the Armenian portion, which is sort of on one side. What makes it an interesting story is you may not know that while the negotiations to resolve this were going on, not one of the entities who had an interest in that property was allowed to negotiate with the Israeli government. It was the representative of the Archbishop of Canterbury who was negotiating the deal on behalf of all three of our communities. And the reason I know it is because we had a meeting with this fellow who was doing the negotiating one evening that we were there in Jerusalem. Things are still bad then. I don't know what else to say. Moving on, wonderful experience. I got to participate in the dedication of the Denver Diocese Center. It was snowing, but it was just beautiful. And Metropolitan uh, Isaiah is, so almost everybody's been a chancellor of Chicago at some point. Metropolitan <laughs> 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 McKee is, <laughs> really, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, so he's a good friend too. But it was absolutely fabulous. It was like being at a festival, festive occasion with maybe 600 of your first cousins. And, I, and I'm supposed to now speak. Now, what am I going to say? I brought greetings to the Clergy Lady Congress for you that were there. And I'm standing here saying, okay, I'm here as the president of the National Council of Churches, and I bring you greetings from 50 million Christians. It's, a great, it's true. And I guess I'm talking to myself because I'm one of you and one of us. And that always gives you a big charge, and it's a wonderful thing to be able to do. And finally, just before I came here, uh, I was at the Episcopal Convention in Minneapolis. And a couple of things that you should know, if you don't know this about the Episcopal Church, I found it absolutely fascinating. The rule book for their convention, which is only every three years, is over 200 pages long. Number two, there are 10,000 people attending that convention. And number three, I found out they have 130-some bishops, I believe, and 130-some dioceses, okay? So we go into their House of Deputies, which is about seven, 800 people, all voting with electronic keypads. So none of this yes and no, and who can shout louder. And what was amazing, <laughs> no, well, we've been to some of our meetings, they're fascinating. <laughs> um, but, but what was amazing to me was this. We think of our church and how we represent ourselves and what we do in our congresses, and we all know that every parish sends the priest, uh, the president of the parish council, and two other lay person, two other persons elected by the general assembly. That's your delegation. That's what it says in the rules. When you look at it, though, you look at the fact that we're basically sending three lay people for every clergy. Now, what was fascinating to me was of the delegates from the diocese in the House of Deputies. It was a 50-50 ratio between clergy and lay people. And when you add the House of Bishops with 130 some, it's 55, 60% clergy versus laity. 
These are the interesting things you find out. Then I found out the Presbyterians have an even larger rule book. I didn't want to go there. <laughs> now, I'm just, oh, and this was the best. I'm going to start preaching because it was wonderful fun. The International Council of Community Churches, which has been in, a member of the council for 20, 30 years, and was organized about 50 years ago between two different community church groups, invited me to preach at their closing worship service uh, of their conference in Cleveland a few weeks ago. And you know, preach. I'm so well trained for that. And, and, and it really, and, but fortunately, the theme was hospitality in the household of God. And guess who was there? Abraham was right here, Sarah was right there, and it was just amazing how it all fell together. And no one left, and, and no one said bad things. But, it, but seriously though, it gives you an opportunity to do some of the most unusual and unique things you never would have imagined yourself doing. And every single time, and every single place, everybody knew not only that I was a woman, that's reasonably obvious I hope, but that I was an orthodox person. And the questions you get from all of this and all these places and where you are is an opportunity to share, an opportunity to make people know, hey, I, boy, do I have a package for you right here. And here's some of the wrapping, and, and if you look in here, you can see what some of it is and so on. And I want to say that part of what I've done in the church over these years, I think it probably is because I'm a woman. And as such, had these opportunities because, like the Theological Commission, where the Armenian priest left, I would never have been in that kind of environment. They didn't need a woman in that moment, and preferably an Orthodox, because there wasn't another one other than the co chair. And in so many instances. So, this is telling me something very important. Each and every one of us, male or female, young or old, are offer ors, and we all have so many incredible opportunities to offer, you just can't even imagine. Thank you very much.